Hello and welcome to the channel. I'm Will and this is my workshop which is actually in my kitchen. And if you're a long time viewer of the channel then I'm the voice that you've been hearing for the past few years. Uh, this is the first time that I've done a face reveal on the channel and of course it's a moment that every YouTuber dreads. I mean what if they all stop watching or something? But I figure it's better for you guys to get to know me a little bit better. So here I am and uh, let's get stuck into the content for today. In today's episode, we're going to be looking at the NEC V20 CPU. I'm going to be showing all of the EGA cards in my current EGA card collection. We're going to be emulating the 8080 CPU from Intel and looking at the earliest version of Microsoft Basic. And we're going to try and get to the bottom of a corruption issue which I saw in EGA games in the previous video on the channel. First off today, I'm going to take a look at the NEC V20 CPU. This is a really inexpensive upgrade for machines that use the Intel 8088 CPU, the heart of the PC and XT and clone machines. Basically you just take the old chip out, plop the new one in and the machine magically goes faster. Now I've got an 8 megahertz and a 10 megahertz one here and we'll take a look at both of those. And viewers on the channel have requested that I do this really quite often because if you look around at the other YouTube videos that are available on this topic, they just swap the chips over, do some benchmarks, and leave it at that. But it turns out this chip is way more interesting than that. Now I'm going to be putting the V20 in this machine here, which is my XT clone machine. It's a clone of the original IBM XT, which was very similar to the original IBM PC. Both had an 8088 CPU running at 4.77 MHz. The main difference with the XT is that it had a full height hard drive. Now this machine has a half height hard drive and a half height floppy as well, but the main difference with this clone is that it has a Turbo XT motherboard, which means that it can run at 10 MHz as well as the original 4.77. Now it's sitting alongside my Amstrad PC1512, which is also an XT class machine, but it has an 8086 CPU at 8 MHz instead of the 8088. And NEC had a chip for this as well. It was called the V30, and we'll be checking that out in a later video on the channel. So subscribe if you're interested in that, and click the notification icon if you'd like to be told when the video is uploaded. Now I've got to say that putting one of these in an XT machine like this comes with just a little bit of nostalgia for me. These were a really inexpensive upgrade back in the day, and it only took about 15 minutes to install, even for an inexperienced teenager as I was at the time. And of course, as a kid, you were entirely dependent on your parents for everything. You couldn't afford to go out and buy the latest and greatest 286 or even a 386. And so I just loved the idea that you could put this in with so little effort and money, and all of the applications and games would just run faster. Now putting one of these V20s in shouldn't be too much of a chore. I've got the 8 MHz one here and I'm going to try that first. So first of all I'm just going to pull some of these cards out uh, so that we can get to the CPU. I'll just take the floppy cable off here and I'll also take the floppy controller out. And the CPU is this one down here. You've got to be careful not to mix it up with the co-processor, so the 8087, which would be next to it uh, if I had one in here. Now I've got this little chip puller and I don't think that this is a particularly good one but it makes it just a little bit easier to get the CPU out. Uh, you just have to be careful not to take the socket out as well as the CPU itself. Uh, but it does make it just that little bit easier to get out and then it's just a matter of putting the V20 in. Now you'll notice that on the end of the chip is a little notch and that should line up with a notch in the socket itself. So just be careful that all of the pins go into the socket. Uh, you might have to bend the pins a little bit uh, to get it to fit in, especially if it's a new chip. And it just slots in like that. Just make sure all the pins are in and that it's in firmly. And that's all there is to it. Now I've just got the 8 MHz chip in at the moment and I am booting at 4.77 MHz. Now I've been told that the 8 MHz chips actually overclock to 10 MHz usually. So I'm also going to try that out. And fortunately the machine seems to be booting okay here. So what I'm going to do is start up top bench and just check that we actually have a V20. There's a lot of remarked chips around and I want to make sure that it's not just an 8088 that's been rebadged or something like that. 
Now, if you're going to benchmark vintage computers of this era, you really want to use Top Bench, which stands for the Old School PC Benchmark. It's free and there's a link in the description. It was written by Jim Lannard, aka Trickster in the demo scene, a good friend of the channel, and it was really written for specifically this kind of thing. And the good news is that on this machine, it benchmarks at the speed of an NEC V20 at 4.77 MHz, which is precisely what we want to see. It means that the CPU is almost certainly genuine. Now, as I said earlier, this XT clone is a Turbo XT, and it has a jumper down here for changing from 4.77 MHz up to 10 MHz. Now, this particular V20 CPU is only rated at 8, but I want to test out the claim that these almost always overclock to 10. Well, when I first turned this on, it got all the way to the DOS prompt, and then I couldn't type anything, so I'm just rebooting it to see if that was a fluke. And yeah, it looks like it's hung here, so I don't think these CPUs are going to work at 10 MHz. So fortunately I have some that are actually rated for 10 MHz, so I'm going to put one of those in now. This is the 10 MHz V20, and it's a bit hard to read the numbering on this chip. I'm a bit worried it could be a fake or relabeled. So uh, we're going to put it in and try it out, and maybe I'll be able to breathe a little easier. I've disconnected the hard drive and removed the hard drive controller because I've been having trouble with this drive and it makes really weird noises with this CPU in. But let's see if it boots up and see if there's any problems with the CPU at 10 MHz. And it looks like it's going through okay, so let's run top bench and see what we get. Oh yeah, it says that it's performing like a V30 at 8 MHz, which is probably just about right actually. A V30 wouldn't work in this machine of course, it would require an 8086 socket. But given the performance, it probably means that it's a genuine V20 and it seems to be working, which is great news. Now check this out, I put this machine into top bench and this is the machine with the V20 in and I benchmarked it again with just the 8088, both at 10 MHz. And you can see that it gets a score of 11 now instead of 9. Even the video memory is accessing a little faster now than it was before. But the real story is that the opcodes, the CPU instructions, actually execute faster on the V20 than on the 8088. But the other part of the story is that the memory access is also faster. And also this mysterious memory effective address, which I'm going to have to explain because it's really important to understanding this CPU. Now, I know what you're thinking, but Will, am I even going to notice a 22% uplift in performance? It's not like it's a 286 or something, which would be three times faster. And I think 22% really is just about at the point where you would start to notice. But this CPU has a whole load of additional tricks up its sleeve. It has twice as many transistors as the 8088, so it must have some secrets, right? And this is where I think other videos on this topic have stopped short. But before I get on to all of that, I want to talk about this mysterious effective address thing. Now, if you've ever looked up an 8088 instruction in a book, you'll see something like this. This is just a subtraction for taking one value away from another. And you'll see two timings here. One is if you're taking a value away from a CPU register. So the whole computation happens inside the CPU and it's really fast for CPU cycles. But if you try to take that same value away from a memory location, it'll be much slower. 17 cycles plus something called the effective address computation. It's a little computation that the CPU has to do to compute the address of the memory location that you're dealing with. And the effective address computation on the 8088 can be really slow. You can see from this table here that it can be up to an additional 12 processor cycles depending on how many different registers have to be combined together to compute the address that you want to deal with. But take a look at the exact same instruction on the NEC V20. It's still four cycles if you're subtracting from a CPU register. But if you subtract a value from memory, it's a flat 18 cycles. There's no additional cost for the effective address computation. And this is one of the things that makes the NEC V20 a really amazing CPU. If you know about this sort of thing, and you write your code specially for this CPU, you can do things on this that you can't even dream of on the 8088. And this is where things get a little bit sad. I've had a look about, and I can't find anybody in our community who's written some really cool code, which is specifically optimized for the V20. Not even in the demo scene, which is really unusual. 
So it looks like the sort of thing I'd have to do myself. And after all, I guess that's one of the things the channel is really about. But I want to hear from you. Uh, would you like to see this in a future video? If so, give a thumbs up on the video and let me know in the comments below what you'd like to see. And maybe I'll write a really cool graphical effect or something to really show off the power of this CPU. Another thing that the V20 was really good at is multiplication and division. Here's the timings for the 8088. It can be up to 168 cycles plus an effective address computation if you're dealing with memory. But here's the exact same instruction on the NEC V20, a flat 35 cycles. This thing was really good at multiplication and division. But that's not even nearly it. There was also a whole pile of additional instructions which didn't even exist on the 8088. Here's an example here. This instruction is amazing. It allows you to load data from literally anywhere in memory right down to the bit. And you're not limited to just 8 or 16 bits at a time. You can load any number of bits up to 16. And it's all done in 34 to 59 cycles. Now, that might seem a little expensive, but if you compare this with the long sequence of 8088 instructions, you'd need to do the same thing. This is really significant. So if you can learn how to use instructions like this, which don't even exist on the 8088, you can really get some amazing performance out of this CPU. But wait, there's more. As well as coming with a set of steak knives, the V20 can actually emulate an 8-bit Intel 8080 CPU, a predecessor to the 8086 and 8088. Coming right at you, 8-bit guy. But all jokes aside, uh, this is something we can actually try out on the channel today. I'm using a program called 22Nice here, and this allows you to run programs that were designed to run under CPM on DOS. There's a little utility that comes with it called GenCom, and you just put in the name of a CPM program, which you've renamed to have the extension CPM, and it'll convert it to a DOS.com program that you can actually run under DOS. Now the program I just converted is a chess game called Sargon, and this would normally run on an 8080 CPU, but GenCom will allow us to run it on an 8088. So let's try that out first. We just call Sargon, it's just a normal DOS file now, and it'll run the Sargon game. When it finally starts up, it asks us a few questions. We can start a new game. I don't want to use a printer and I'll play as white. And I'm going to put it on the highest level here and display every move. So it brings up a little chess board and you just type in the piece that you want to move. So if I want to move E2 to E4, for example, and then Sargon thinks and so I could do D2 to D3, for example, and it thinks some more and on it goes. You can see that it's bogged down for quite a while here trying to compute its next move. And uh, this is going to be very slow. Uh, we'll see if it's any faster when we actually use the genuine 8080 mode that the V20 provides. Now the way that works is we specify processor equals V20 when we do the conversion from CPM to DOS using GenCom. And now we should just be able to run Sargon on the V20 using the 8080 emulation mode. And so let's see if it's any faster. Well, that's a bit disappointing. It turns out that there are a couple of different CPUs that CPM programs were typically written for. The 8080 and also the Z80. The Z80 was backwards compatible with the 8080, but it doesn't go in the other direction. A lot of commercial applications, boring office applications and so on, were written to work on both the 8080 and the Z80. But other things like games were often written to run just on the Z80 alone. And so that means we can't use the V20 to run those. Now there was a chess game that was written for the 8080, but I haven't been able to find a copy of that that was preserved and also ported to CPM. But I have found something really interesting that we can run. Microsoft BASIC for the 8080. Look at the copyrights there, 1977. This is actually what got Microsoft started. So I've written a one-line program here that we can run, first of all, just using ordinary software emulation of the 8080. 
This is just using 22 NICE and it's not actually using the special hardware emulation of the V20. It's just using software that acts like an 8080 to run Microsoft Basic. Well, that was pretty slow. So what I've done now is use GenCom to create a version of MBasic that runs with the special 8080 emulation mode of the V20. So this is going to use hardware emulation this time. Oh wow, look at how much faster it is. So this is actually the best way to run 8080 programs on a PC. It's like at least 10 times faster, I would say, than what we had previously. Amazing. Now, obviously anything that's CPM based, especially if it's emulated, is going to be text mode only. And we really want to try out some graphical stuff, so I guess I'm just going to have to sit down and write some code. Unless you guys can find something else in the meantime that is a game or something that is optimized for the V20. If you find anything, let me know in the comments below. But uh, for now, let's move on to the next topic for today's video, which is corruption in EGA games. In the previous video on the channel, I made a video about early 3D DOS games, and quite a number of them had corruption on various EGA cards. And I want to try and get to the bottom of that. Let me start by showing some corruption, which I didn't show in the previous video, in Stellar 7. So this is some kind of glint that appears on the logo here, and as you can see, it's just all washed out with a white block. And once you get into the game itself, you can see there's also some corruption on this intro screen here. So there's something definitely wrong here, and I didn't show this in the video because I discovered that my Genoa chipset cards don't seem to have this problem. But there were other games with problems too, like Echelon with missing blocks in this pyramid scene in the introduction. And in F19 Stealth Fighter, the map is all messed up, whatever that display on the left is, and also the target display. Uh, so that doesn't look right. Then in Interface, if you look at the bottom, all the status bar is messed up. And that looks similar to the problem we had in Stellar 7. So maybe that's related. And then in F16 Combat Pilot, there's some flashing displays on the dash. And I'm pretty sure they're not supposed to be like that. So there's widespread problems across multiple games. Now all of these games have one thing in common, they're EGA and I don't have problems with them in CGA mode. So I thought this would be a great opportunity to show you my current EGA card collection. I bought a few new ones over Christmas last year and actually some other cards as well, some CGA and VGA ones. And I'll certainly have to make a video about those on the channel at some point. Now you've seen my IBM EGA card before, so I don't need to go into that. And there's a whole video on this smart EGA card on the channel. But I managed to find another similar card with the same Genoa chipset, but no smart EGA written on the BIOS here. Uh, so that's something I'm going to look into on the channel at some point. Uh, this is an EGA Wonder 800 Plus, and I think I have shown that on the channel. And I may or may not have shown that one. I don't recall. It's a Paradise EGA card which is really interesting, and uh, possibly I actually repaired that in a video uh, once previously. I'm not sure. Uh, this is a Chipson Technology half-length card, and then I have a Chipson Technology full-length card. This is an EJ Multi-Res card. Uh, so that's my current collection, and what we'll do is we'll focus on just one of the games that we're having problems with, Stellar 7, and we'll try and narrow down what it is about these cards that these games don't like. It turns out there's one more card. There's another full-length Chips and Technologies card. So I have quite a few of those. And let's start with that. So I'll put this in my 286 first. I had a little bit of a problem with this card initially, and it just turned out to be some loose chips. But yeah, this definitely exhibits the problem. So we'll put that on our list. Now Jim Leonard suggested that I try out Check It to test the memory in the EGA cards. Jim's actually made a number of contributions to this video. For example, he suggested to use the Sidex software, 22NICE, for the 8080 emulation. So thanks, Jim. Anyway, let's go to Tests, and we'll go to Video, Video RAM, and it says press a key to continue. So it just fills the RAM with all sorts of random stuff. I presume it's supposed to look like this. Uh, let's see if it finds any problems. And look at that, there's a whole bunch of issues. They're all parity errors, all starting at OA4000 in hexadecimal. 
really weird. I wouldn't have thought there was anything wrong with this card. So many games work perfectly on it. The next card to look at is this Genoa Smart EGI card, which is the one that we featured in a video recently on the channel. But check out what happens when I put it in this machine. When I reset the machine, it doesn't get far in the boot process and then it gives me a parity error, which I've never seen before just from putting an EGA card in a machine. If you have any ideas what this might be, uh, let me know in the comments below. Now two of the cards seem to be set up for 350 line EGA, this half length Paradise EGA card, and the other full length Chips and Technologies card, the EGA multi -res. So I'm just going to skip these cards for now and we'll come back to those if we actually need them. The next card to try is this EGA Wonder 800 Plus. This is an ATI card as far as I can see and it's a little bit of a weird card so I don't use it very much but let's see what we get. Now you might see some flicker with this card because it uses some kind of weird uh, interlacing mode and of course you're going to get a line going down the screen and look at that it works fine on this card so this one seems to be okay. The next one to try is this half-length Genoa card, which I bought because it looks very similar to the Smart EGA card, which we had a video about. It's got exactly the same chipset, for example. So let's see if this one gives any kind of parity error. This one seems to boot fine, so let's try the game out and see whether it works here. And yeah, it's fine. So it seems like all of the more recent cards are working great. And finally, we'll test this original IBM EGA card. Uh, this is a really reliable card. I've used it a lot in the past, so I know it's working. Uh, so we'll see what happens with this one. Well, here goes. Let's see what happens. And it's displaying OK. Ah, look at that. It's got corruption and in exactly the same place. So this is weird. I wouldn't have expected that. Let's try check it on this card. By the way, I ran check it on the system RAM just to make sure there's nothing wrong with the machine itself. And I also ran it on those other video cards and those also aren't showing up any issues. So let's try this IBM EGO card and see what check it has to say about that. And it's just running through with random data as it was before. Oh my goodness, look at that! It's a bunch of parity errors, just like we had with the other card. And the same address as well, A4000 in hexadecimal. And it's checked 64 kilobytes. Wait a minute, are these cards 64K and the other ones are 256K? Is that what's going on here? Maybe these games require a 256K EGA card. Oh gosh! Yeah, that's totally going to be it, guys. The original IBM EGA card, of course, only has 64K. And this is a really early Chips and Technologies card, a full-length EGA, and also only has 64 kilobytes. The two later cards, of course, have 256K. So that totally explains what's going on. So I ran all of these cards in the games, and except for Echelon, you see exactly the same behavior. The cards either work in all the games or don't work in all the games. So all of those issues were explained by the one problem. Uh, now as for Echelon, uh, Jim Leonard pointed out that the photograph on Moby Games for Echelon also has these missing blocks. So that actually seems to be deliberate on the part of the game designers. It's nothing to do with the EGA cards at all. So I think we've finally explained all of the issues here. Well, let me know what you think about the new format for videos on the channel with multiple segments, just like a show every week, and of course, my face on camera. Anyway, that's it for this week. Uh, thanks very much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe down below, and uh, we'll see you in a later video. Bye.